Hey, folks, welcome to the program. Yes, this is the program. That's it. This is all there is, okay? There's, there's no dancing girls. There's no juggling. It's just, it's just I just talk to people. But here's the good news. Some very interesting people. And many of them are friends of mine. For example, Amanda Grace, you're a friend of mine. Hello. Hello, friend. I like to just, I get to just talk to, to people that I like. They're friends. They've become mm -hmm. friends. You've become a friend. And uh, I get to introduce my audience to the people that uh, I love. And you, you're tough to sum up, though. You're tough to sum up. Your husband, Chris, is sitting over there. Mm -hmm. We're gonna, we'll talk about him later. But how do I... How do, how do, how do I, for, I want to get your story, first of all, mm -hmm. but for people that are just tuning in, they're like, what is this? Did this woman write a book on the history of the Nazis? Did she, what, you know, like, what, what, how do you sum yourself up? Well, I, I joke around and I say, and I'll explain why, I, I, I'm sort of like a prophesying female version of Noah. <laughs> and that's a prophesying <laughs> female version, version of Noah. Noah. I don't think anybody's tracking with that, so we're going to start over. <laughs> You, first of all, as soon as you open your mouth, I know this is a woman who grew up in the New York area. Yes. Mm -hmm. So where did, what part of New York? Uh, I was born at Einstein Hospital in the Bronx. In the Bronx? In the Bronx, New York. Grew up near Pelham Parkway area. My father's from Gun Hill Road, actually, in the Bronx. And then we moved like to the that, South Like that's going to ring bells across the country? Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, Dunhill Road, Bronx, Pelham Parkway. Why did you say that? Why do you, like, what is that area known for? What do you mean? Well, right near Williams Bridge Road, right off of Pelham Parkway, happened to be one of the nicer areas of the Bronx. Okay. So that's where my Nana and Papa lived, okay. my mom's parents. So when you say Nana and Papa, that's mm -hmm. another clue, Italian. Yes. Or Italian. Mm -hmm. My wife is Italian. And so that's another thing. When I first, uh, my, it was my friend Joel Tusharon, dear, dear friend, uh, Brooklyn, Italian. He said, you got to check out Amanda Grace. And when Suzanne and I went to your YouTube channel to, to watch you, I just thought, this is incredible. This is a woman that is obviously like really outspoken about her Christian faith, to put it mildly. You, mo you, you move in the prophetic. That's mm -hmm. another one of those terms that a lot of people are like, what does it mean you move in the prophetic, whatever? We'll get to that. But, uh, but you're obviously a real New Yorker. Yes. Which, you know, usually people who delve into this kind of stuff, you know, they might be from Kansas or Texas, but not from New York. So it's amazing. That's why I want to get your story. Mm -hmm. So the short version is you are on YouTube talking about two things. Your, your animals, because you've got a million animals, not literally, how many do you have now? We have 60 at the sanctuary total. Six, between the two you have properties. an animal sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> I wanna, we're going to talk about that. And, and then you also, God speaks to you prophetically. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people listening to this program they are like, what's that? Or there are actually other people that are hostile. And I'm speaking to those hostile people right now. You need to back it up. Um, because th this is really something some people don't understand. But I, I want to get your story of how this happened to you and, and what happened with Chris. So... When you grew up, okay, Italian-American family in the Bronx, were, were you raised as a Christian? Did you go to church? I did. I actually was raised in a divided household, so my father was not a believer at all. Thank God, before, right before he died in 2019, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior before he went home. But he was not a believer at all, wanted nothing to do with it. And my mother was sort of a new believer. So the church that I grew a part of my life in is actually Van Nest. I think it's Assembly of God now on Holland Avenue in the Bronx. Okay, Very so Assembly of church. God believes mm -hmm. in all this crazy stuff, which I also do. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because when you think of an Italian from the Bronx, you think in Catholic. Yes, and both my parents were raised that. Right. So they were both raised Catholic. My father just sort of rejected it all completely, yeah. and my mother sort of turned the corner in her early 20s, mid-20s. Okay, so she had a, a Jesus experience, mm -hmm. and so she, um, so, when, so when you were growing up, were you, did you go to church with her? Yes, so I did go to Van Nest, very spirit-filled, Pentecostal yeah. church. 
Uh, and so that's where I basically got the foundation of my faith is from there. Now, it was a little hard because my father wasn't a believer. So at home, you can't really talk about it. So what happens is everything goes internal. That's where the issue started. You never know now because of, of, of the way, you know, I'm very open when I pray and things, but everything started to internalize in me where don't pray out loud, don't pray out loud at dinner, don't talk about God in front of your father. So everything just became very like, almost like a clamp got put on me Yeah. early on. Well, so uh, when you were in high school, whatever, mm -hmm. what were you thinking your future was going to be? What did you want to do with yourself? Well, interestingly enough, I, I had two traits. And I understand why the Lord gave me these gifts now, but I was very artistic and I was also very good with numbers. And so I had the whole right brain, right brain, left brain thing going on at the same time. And so I started tracking going more towards finance in high school. Now, from the time I was a small child, like six years old, I would start going. I would go, couldn't go really to my father and say this, but I, you know, I would say, do you know there are throne rooms in heaven and this is what they look like? And I saw them and I would say things that were prophetic at a very young age. Wait a minute, wait, wait, I don't remember this. I don't mm -hmm. remember anything because I've had you on the program. We've talked about this, I put this like a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me at a very young age, you would have these profound spiritual experiences because a lot of us who are very serious about God don't have that particular gifting. It's an amazing thing to say that when you were a little kid, you had visions of heaven. Mm -hmm. And how did you know it was real and it wasn't just you know too much sugar? Well, because I would I would have been told I don't remember all of it, but that I was a very kind of peculiar child. So I was overly curious. I was too smart for my own good. I was told, and so I wasn't known to say these outlandish things unless I really experienced them. I was also very sick as a child, very ill uh, as a child. The enemy started on me very well, early. Well, with what? What did you have? So I had horrific asthma to the point where I would be hospitalized in oxygen tents. I would be getting shots of adrenaline every week. Whoa. Uh, it, was, it was really bad. It started at the age of four when I was found blue in my crib. Oh. And so we started this battle. And it was not easy because I have a father that's a neurotic who, who, who smokes a lot and is in the house doing this at the same time that this is happening yeah. to me. So the, the two kind of, you know, did not mesh. And so this went on. The, the, the bout with the asthma and pneumonia and all of these things went on through my childhood until I hit teenagehood. And that's when I started being hospitalized for horrific stomach issues. Couldn't keep anything down. And they didn't know what that was. They weren't sure what it was. You know, it, at one point it was E. coli it started, but then it started to be st into the arena of gastroparesis and these other things where it's very slow motility. These were all kind of autoimmune issues, and I call yeah. this the tremor before the earthquake. So these are all the tremors and the warning signs that okay. something bigger was coming. What do you mean something bigger? Uh, well, that, that goes on and begins in my early 20s is when kind of everything comes crashing down. Okay, and at that point, <clears throat> are you looking for a career in finance? What are you looking to do? At that point, actually, because I, I graduated with a bachelor's of science from Siena College. A bachelor's in science from Siena yeah, College. Yeah, bachelor's of science, okay. yes, and so in finance. And I went into a company called Globop Financial Services, which was an enormous hedge fund company. And the funny part about Globop is they gave everybody a financial IQ test before they would even hire them. And the highest score was a 40, and I scored an 80 on this test, and I doubled their highest score. So they hired me pretty much on so the So you're spot. a freak. Yeah. <laughs> you're a freak. You're so, you're so brainy when it comes to numbers. That's actually obviously crazy. Mm -hmm. So they hired you. Obviously, they hired you. Yes, they did. But you're telling me, so you're on this fast track in this world, mm -hmm. and then you have a major problem. Okay, we're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to find out what that was. I'm talking to Amanda Grace. Uh, you can find her at arcofgraceministries.com. We'll be right back. Folks, welcome back. I'm talking to my friend Amanda Grace, who's with Amanda Grace, who's with Arc of Grace Ministries. And Albin pointed out that the website is arcofgrace-ministries.com. <laughs> Not dash, hyphen. Dash is twice as long as a hyphen. Arc of Grace hyphen ministries.com. Amanda, mm -hmm. you're fun to talk to, so I get silly. Um, so you're telling me that 
you get the super high score. You're mm-hmm. like a financially gift. You're gifted in the financial numbers world mm-hmm. in your brain, and yet something happens with your health. What happens? So nine months in, and I took care of myself because of what happened when I was younger. So I was even on a men's volleyball league at that point. I mean, I was very a busy. men's volleyball. A men's volleyball league. Did yes. they know you were a woman? Yes, I think- they did. They okay. absolutely knew. There was a few of us that were allowed in to play All with right. them. But you were you were physically fit yes. enough to play volleyball and you're tall. You have to be a little bit tall yes. to play volleyball mm-hmm. effectively. Okay, so you're you're healthy, what mm-hmm. happens? So nine months in, I start to feel fluish and I collapse on the bathroom floor and I'm rushed to emergency and they cannot figure out what's going on with me. Now I know now what happened, but back then they, they're doing Lyme tests and they're doing all sorts of blood work. They can't figure it out. I've become suddenly very weak, can barely walk, uh, having even brain fog, you know, to a degree, having a little bit of issues, you know what I mean, thinking clearly. Uh, listen, in 1990, I've never told you about this, but in 19, at the end of 1990, I had a health episode, and they tested me for Lyme, and I went through this mm-hmm. whole thing, and I had brain fog for years. I had stuff. I mean, I normally mm-hmm. don't talk about it, but uh, you know, they don't. They themselves don't know. They're mm-hmm. giving you all these tests and doing this and that. They say it's autoimmune. It's Epstein Barr. It's Lyme. It's this. It's that. So what happens? So I end up having to go to Columbia Presbyterian after going through so many doctors, and his name was Dr. David Adams, actually, who was the neurologist. And he actually hospitalized me because my blood pressure had gone down so low to like 70 over 40. He goes, there's no way you're going home. So now I'm hospitalized. And he, he decides he's going to do something called a tilt table test. He does the tilt table test and he comes back and he says, I know there's something else there and I can't identify it. He's like, but you're definitely fighting pot syndrome. POTS syndrome? Yes, which stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So basically, when you go to stand up, your heart rate goes whoop and your blood pressure plummets. Uh, And so basically, he says, okay, we've done this test and, and you definitely are fighting this and I need to send you to rehab because I couldn't walk. I was so weak and I was so sick that I had lost a lot of the ability to walk. I still could like move my legs and things like that, but I was very weak. So he wants to admit me to Burke in 2004, which is in Westchester, which is one of probably the best rehabilitation hospitals there are. My husband actually was there years and years and years later. And so they admit me to Burke. And? And so... Now I'm there for Christmas and New Year's, and I'm fighting to try to walk and regain my strength. And something very interesting happened there. It seemed anywhere the Lord put me, and unbeknownst to me at that young age, he would, he would use me in different ways. And there was this quadriplegic named Michael, who, a very sad story, he had been jumped in the South Bronx, and they paralyzed him. It was horrible. He'd Teenage been beaten mm-hmm. into paralysis. He'd been beaten into paralysis. His name was Michael. So they couldn't get Michael to do anything, basically to engage in anything, to try to use it, because he still could move his arms a little bit. He just really didn't have much use of his hands. So they said, let's put Amanda with Michael and see if we can get him to engage. So they did that. And sure enough, Michael starts talking to me, and I start visiting him in his room, and... I kept in touch with Michael for a long time, but Michael in at Burke ended up accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And we kept in touch after that, after I got out and I started to improve. We kept in touch for a long time. Well, it's amazing how you, you can just imagine how some people, if, if you don't even know about the possibility of Jesus and the reality of God, how you would fall into hopelessness. That's mm-hmm. the normal thing. You would fall into total hopelessness and despair, mm-hmm. and God used you in that. Mm-hmm. But okay, so, so this happens in your life, and what comes out of this? So what comes out of this, when I come home, I start now the battle of trying to get to the point where I can work and I can completely function. Yes, I was able to walk. I was using a cane, actually. They got me to the point where I could walk with a cane. And so I. And come, you're in your early 20s? Yeah, I'm in my early to mid 20s at this point. So I would say by this time, I'm probably about 24 years old. And so I started, I couldn't work, but I went, started going to a, a young adults group. 
at Faith Assembly at the church. of God. Well, then now we're now we're we've moved up to the Hudson Valley. My parents okay. moved us. That's kind of a funny story. We could go back to that if you want. <laughs> why we had to move, but so I started going to Faith Assembly, and started in a young adults group called the Crossing, and they had nobody to lead it. So a group of us led it. We didn't know what we were doing, but they didn't have anybody to lead it. So a group of us got together. We started leading this young adults group, and these are my early grounds of training that are going on. Now, what I want to what I want to know is, you said that when you were like a little kid, you're getting visions of mm-hmm. heaven. Mm-hmm. Did that go away for a while? It, it it kind of shifted. So then I started having very prophetic dreams. And there's a very profound one at the age of 26, which which we'll talk about. But that's what happened. It started shifting into prophetic dreams and things of that nature. Um, Prophecy at times when I was a kid would come out of my mouth. Because you don't want to harness it when you're a kid. You don't understand what's going on. So it would kind of just blurt out at, at, you know, strange moments. And so... my friend Ken Fish, mm-hmm. uh, who's been on this program many times, he said that when he was a kid, mm-hmm. that would happen to him. It would totally freak out the adults. Like he would say what they're thinking or he would reveal some secret sin. And he's a kid. And, you know, because the gift is there, but you just don't know how to handle it. Yes. Okay, so keep going. So we. So now we're. I'm in my early 20s, mid 20s. You're in this group, you're helping lead this group. group. Yep, because we moved up to uh, Hudson Valley. The Hudson Valley. Right. From the city or, you know, the the, Bronx south end of New Rochelle area because basically at 11 years old, I was a witness in a robbery. (laughs) And so basically... Wait, 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 wait. Slow down, slow down. Folks, you understand what I'm dealing with trying to host this show? (laughs) Trying to wrangle these wild guests... That you're now in your mid twenties. Yes. But when you were eleven, you were a witness yes. in a robbery yes. in the Bronx. And because of that, you had to get out of that area. Well why all these years later? It didn't go to trial or what? No, no. So basically and this is a very funny story and I'll tell it very fast, but it better be funny. Me and and I had a best friend as a kid named Paul. And the building we were in there was a gas station across the street. So we're in the park playing and we have something called Spy Tech, which was big in the 80s and early 90s with the periscope and the whole, and the whole kit. So we see the, this man walk into the gas station and put a knife to the throat of the cashier. So we get below the wall and we put the periscope up so we can still witness This what, is like Harriet the Spy. On. This is like every adolescent or every 11-year-old's fantasy that we would have spy gear and we would see an actual... Yes. Okay. So me and Paul Dedu, since he was on the fourth floor, he lived, and yeah. I was on the sixth floor, he can co- tell his mother quicker what was going on. So we deduce this, <laughs> and he yells, because he had been watching too much of the A-team, he yells, cover me, and he jumps over the wall. <laughs> he goes running. Cover me like you've got a gun? So he gets to his mom, Yeah. and I know she called, because all of a sudden I see cop cars come in, like tons of them just swarming the gas station, right? Pulling their, basically pulling their guns on him, because he's yeah. got a knife to the cashier's yeah. throat. Um, and he was a disgruntled employee that had gotten fired. So we were witnesses in this and had to tell the police right. what we saw. But you're 11. I'm 11. And after this happens, my parents were still married at the time. Yeah. They went, it's time to move. We need to start oh, okay. so for you another moved, place to live. So you moved to the Hudson Valley after that. Yes, after that All incident. Right. Yes. So now mm-hmm. I'm, starting to, I'm starting to get it. Listen, it was I, one of the reasons. when I was eight, mm-hmm. we left the city. Uh, I'm older than you, but we left the city for similar reasons. Things are going downhill. Giuliani hadn't been invented yet. Uh, We didn't have the city didn't get safe, you know, for whatever. And so, yeah, if you could, you get your kids the heck out of Dodge Mm -hmm. because why do you want to raise your kids in that environment? Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, you are in... Now we're in the Hudson Valley. The Hudson Valley, you're Mm -hmm. in your 20s, and you're in this group, kind of like a young people's group at the church. Okay. Yes, and so I'm... I'm so sick at this point. I'm getting something called IVIG treatments intravenously uh, every two weeks. Of what? At the house. So basically they are human white blood cells that are put into you to try to give you an immune system you don't oh have. My gosh. They're considered a form of chemo, so they don't make you feel very well. You don't lose your hair oh or anything like gosh. that, but it's considered that. So I'm on this at this point. 
And so I did the, the crossing for quite a few years, and that was sort of that the was beginning this, of this, the training. The it, young people's group. Yes, the training All ground. Right. And at the same time this is going on, right, because this is where the animal park comes in that the Lord oh, feeds yeah, them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lord has me taking in stray cats that have no homes and feral cats and rehabilitating them and adopting them out. So this was my training. This was the beginning All of right, it. This right is here. the beginning. <laughs> this is where it, the beginning of the crazy. We're going to be okay. right back talking to my friend Amanda Grace. You can find her at arcofgrace-ministries.com. Folks, welcome back. I'm talking to my friend Amanda Grace, who has <clears throat> a prophetic ministry. I don't know how you put this. We're going to, we're going to try to mm-hmm. help you understand this if you don't get this. Also has a, uh, an animal sanctuary mm-hmm. with zillions of beasts uh, at her home with her husband, Chris, uh, who will be here later. And um, you're at that point now, so you're telling me you're in your 20s, mm-hmm. and you're, you're really struggling. I mean, this is bad, bad, bad health stuff. Mm-hmm. But you are a Christian, and you're trying to get your way, work your way out of this. Yes, so I, I think in your 20s is where you, you begin to struggle a lot with the Lord and your place and have a lot of questions for God, the whys. Yeah. The why this, the why that, where you really start seeking and what I call it wrestling with God about many things that have gone on in your families. You know, my parents divorced in, when I was about 21 years old. They divorced, um, and, and that was part of the toxicity that led to me getting sick also. It it kind of opened the door for the enemy to sort of like say, I'm going to take my shot now because the enemy, Satan, can see anointing in the spirit. He can see that you're anointed. He doesn't know what God's necessarily going to do with it, but he can see you are. And so that's why he goes after them when they're young, you hear this. You hear this over and over mm -hmm. and over again, and that if if God's going to use you in some ways, um, he will allow you to be humbled, uh, yes. and it's almost like, you know, to to build your spiritual muscles. And similarly, as you just said, uh, if God is going to use you, the enemy wants to strangle you in the cradle if possible, to try to take you out yes. before, and I've seen this mm-hmm. over and over and over. I could tell my own story, other people's stories, but so you experience this. So here you yes, are in your 20s, mm-hmm. and you're beginning to wonder, hey, what's up? Yes, What's going on? You know, there was a lot of dysfunctional cycles in my family that were very generational. Uh, and when when you deal in the prophetic and, and sort of that's the road the Lord is putting you on, you're very sensitive to what's going on around you. I mean, so sensitive. Uh, you can feel the weight of things in the spirit, like how oppression feels or, you know, how other things feel in the spirit. That You know, you can feel the heaviness of that. And so I started struggling with all of this. And in the middle of this... I have a dream. I actually am being counseled by a gentleman named Pastor Lou, who was at Faith Assembly, who who first introduced me to the deliverance ministry and deliverance and and things of that nature. All the strange things. Because I always want to like annotate Mm -hmm. for my audience. Deliverance is we're talking about exorcism, casting out demons, Mm -hmm. devils, dealing with that. And if you're going to a church that doesn't deal with that. You might think about going to another church because this is real. People yeah. are walking around with this stuff. Okay, so go ahead. So he introduces me to this. And he also begins to counsel me. He had an incredible account himself in a testimony. He was a disgruntled, angry cop that tried to take his life and an angel knocked the gun out of his out of his hand. Wow. It's an incredible account. So Pastor Lou begins to counsel me in the middle of my brokenness. It's, it, this is really the two-part process of restoration. The old wall has to be torn down first, and that's the most this painful This is part. like Kojak meets Touched by an Angel. Yeah. <laughs> I really, it really is. This is like, this is too good. Okay, so, go ahead. So th- I'm in the process of being torn down. Lou's saying, okay, we're going to take all of this down, and we're going to take that down because he's got to rebuild. That's the second part of restoration. But but I want I just want to say, so you, at this point, begin realizing, because we, I know we've talked about it on this program, maybe mm-hmm. with Ken Fish or whatever, but generational curses or things yes. mm-hmm. that are in that that at some point God wants to deal with it, wants mm-hmm. to say this ends here, this curse or this whatever. So mm-hmm. it seems like y- y- that happens to you. I, I came from generations of dysfunctional marriages, men that cheat in marriages. Um, I just came from generations of a lot of junk, anger deep-seated anger and rage, and that was all generational. And now the Lord's got to go through the process of 
breaking me, you know, of some of this stuff so he can do what he wants to do with mm. me. So I'm doing this with Pastor Lou. And at the age of 26, I have a dream. I have a dream. I know that that's how Martin Luther King's speech starts out, too. Well, anybody who has a dream is allowed to say, <laughs> I had a dream or I have a dream. You know, that's OK. Yes. He, 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 he didn't, didn't copyright that. So no. go ahead. OK, yeah. so and there's this enormous room. And I can't even see to the back of the room. And there's all of these tables, and at each table is a different nation, and I was at the head of the room preaching to the nations. Now, this is the dream. A woman who was at Faith Assembly by the name of Brigitte, who was probably one of the most prophetic people I've ever met, wants to come pray for me. She doesn't know I've had this dream. So I'm 26 now. So she wants to come over and pray for me. I'm really sick. I'm really thin. You know, I, I'm not in great shape at that point. So she comes and she prays over me. And she stops. She starts praying in the spirit, too. She, and, and she stops. And she looks at me and she goes, Amanda, the Lord is going to raise you up into a prophetic ministry. And it is going to be a driving force in the world. And it's going to be a different kind of ministry because the Lord is going to build it brick by brick himself and you're going to let him. So you're 26. Mm -hmm. And this woman declares this stuff over you that mm -hmm. obviously God is telling her. Mm -hmm. And did it make sense to you at the time? Or did it just sound cuckoo? Well, I didn't know how. It sounded very right. overwhelming, right. you know, at the right. age of 26. And so, but I had this dream and she doesn't know I have this dream. So now what she's saying is confirming the dream God has given me. And so I went through, that was when I went through the worst of it. So basically after that, entering into my early 30s is when the enemy decided I'm going to throw everything in the kitchen sink at her and I'm going to try to get rid of her now. When we come back, we're going to describe those things. We're going to get mm -hmm. into it. We'll be right back. If you want to find Amanda Grace, you can go to arcofgrace-ministries.com. I just snorted a couple of lines of Adderall. I am so messed up right now. I can't tell you. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. All right, Amanda, you make me silly. Uh, you, um, you were just talking about this moment now. Yes. Where now you're in your late 20s and this woman, Brigitte, who you're still in touch with, no, no, I lost touch with Brigitte. I pray the Lord lets me see Brigitte again. Just okay, so but because because it's amazing that she so she prophesies yes. this thing, but you're saying suddenly now everything goes wrong in your life. Like what? What? Okay, happened? so what happens is well, first before everything goes wrong, I end up meeting Chris. <laughs> okay, so well that's I, good. That's good. So I meet Chris. I'm really sick when I meet him. I'm on those treatments I talked about, IVIG. Like he married me when I was really ill. He picked you out of the gutter. Didn't yes. He? Right. <laughs> That's how Suzanne feels about me. Uh -huh. You were unemployed, but you know, I married you. And uh, we married uh, seven months after meeting. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay. So you're, you, you, I mean, this is uh, interesting. So you're, you're married, but you are still really yes. struggling. And so what happens now? So I start being kind of like a housewife and, and, you know, cooking for Chris. He had, uh, he was a contractor. He's a builder. And so he, you know, had his own company, Wagner Contracting. And so I basically started trying to keep the house and doing things of this nature. Uh, and then I started, we t I actually took in a couple of dogs. And so I, that one from a very high kill shelter down south, the other one just wandered onto my property. This is where the animals just start showing up. So this is the start of where the animals just start showing up. So... Yeah, Roxy was one of the most amazing dogs we ever had. Uh, and so we had her for 11 years. And so I took her in while I wasn't, you know, I, I was in this shape. And then at the age of 33 is when it all sort of comes crashing down. So I wake up and I can't breathe. I'm having a hard time breathing. Uh, my body's acting very weird. And I'm rushed to the ER where they tell me that I have pneumonia in both lungs and one of them has shut down. So my left lung now, no air sounds are coming out of my left lung. My heart is now affected. They had to put a cardiac monitor on me because my heart was being affected. I get admitted, I lose the ability to walk. My body crashes. When I tell you can't walk a lick, this is what happens. Even getting in the wheelchair to go to the bathroom, they had to put me near the nurse's station in the cardiac care unit because my heart rate would shoot up to 167 just trying to get into a wheelchair. So at this time, the Lord is really the only one keeping me alive because there's no reason I should be alive. 
And so this starts a two-month battle in the hospital. I'm in the hospital for two months. Chris is at home with the dogs <laughs> trying to work, and I'm in the hospital. And so this starts the battle of Amanda's got to go to rehab again. We have to try to get her to walk. They started putting these metal things on me that would, it, it, they're like braces that try to force your knees to lock into place because my <laughs> brain and my legs lost communication, oh basically. They weren't speaking at that point. Whoa. And so I'm in the hospital and I'm in the rehab unit. And the funny part about being in the rehab unit, as sick as I was, I start witnessing to the physical therapist. <laughs> And I start witnessing to some of the other patients. So wherever the Lord put me, kind of like, I just couldn't help myself, you know? And I was so blown up on steroids. I mean, they pumped me so obnoxiously full of them, which they shouldn't have done, but they did, uh, that I was so bloated from it. You know, when you get a moon face and you know what I mean? It just can torture your body horribly. So I'm in the hospital two months and I finally come home, but I'm still in a wheelchair. I can't walk. Uh, they tried to put the braces on me. It, you know, it really wasn't working. So I come home, and now I'm home in a wheelchair. So Chris has to go to work all day, and I'm home by myself. And I have a pick line, which basically is a line that they run up your arm to your heart so you don't become a pin cushion for, you know, when they have to give you an IV. Right. So I'm home 10 days. I get hospitalized again with bronchitis. I come home again with pick lines still. And I remember that morning I woke up and I thought I was going to die. I was that ill. And Chris manages to get me in the car and gets me down to the ER where they realize the pick line has become infected. I have developed MRSA and become septic. And doctors don't have much hope because they were they were communing with each other. And I find this out later on. They didn't think my body had what it took. The strength to fight it. To fight it. So this is where now the Lord's grace steps in and, and keeps you alive. And so, so many people, there was so much prayer that went out when this happened. Within two days, my numbers on my blood work doubled, which the doctor couldn't believe. That, that it bounced up that fast because they had no hope. They thought I was, I was going to die. So he came in. Dr. Singh was his name. And he told me that they did not think my body had what it took to fight this. And he was amazed that my numbers have turned around so fast. That was the Lord. That was the Lord stepping in and saying no, you know, ruling and saying no, this is not the end. And so I was in the hospital another week. And I come home, but because of all of that, I became, for all intents and purposes, medically speaking, paralyzed. So I couldn't walk at all. If you tried to stand me up, I'd flop right back in the wheelchair. Like, there was no way I could walk. So now I'm home in a wheelchair. And now there's this wonderful physical therapist named Gary, who was Catholic, who had never seen a miracle and always wanted to. I know the Lord sent him. He gets sent to me. Uh, and he is determined to try to help me. So God bless Gary. Gary was at it for a while. He must have been at it for at least eight months. He probably came in after I was home about maybe five months or so. Gary came into the picture. And so I remember the morning I got up, and the Lord told me that I had to go to church that day. As exhausted as I was, I had to go. So I tell this to Chris, which it was an odyssey for Chris to get me to church. Like, to get me anywhere at that point, it, it was an odyssey. You yeah. know, they don't give you a manual for things like yeah. this in marriage. Yeah. So we go, and the pastors, who at the time was John 316 Christian Center, um, they call everybody up to the front, and they said, we want you to walk up on stage, and we're going to pray for you and lay hands on you. And I'm thinking, I can't walk. Like, what am I doing in this line? And Chris has me in this line. So we get to them, and they ask me, and they say, Amanda, do you want to walk? And I call this my get out of the boat moment. And this is what I call in show business a cliffhanger. <laughs> because right now, we're going to go to a break. Uh, in the beginning of hour two, you'll find out what happened. And much more with Amanda Grace. Don't go away. Okay, Amanda Grace. What mm -hmm. happened? You're at the, you're on the you're yep. you're up there. Mm -hmm. You're at de death's door, mm -hmm. and all these people are praying for you. What happens? 
So when the pastors asked me if I wanted to walk, I call this my get out of the boat moment. Am I going to really have faith? Do I want it that bad that I'm willing to, you know, get out of the boat? So they started to pray, and, and I remember putting my hands on the side of the wheelchair, embracing myself, and all of a sudden, for the first time in a year and a half, I stood up. I was weak, but I stood up. And now they said, do you want to walk? And I said, yes. And I fought for every step. But they walked me, and Chris was holding me also, across that stage. And you could have heard a pin drop. Every, you would have thought people had seen but did it so? A did ghost. it? But did it seem miraculous to you? In other words, that you? Oh, were... it was because I couldn't walk a lick, and everybody knew it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so this happens, and Gary now shows up on Monday. The Catholic physical therapist had <laughs> always wanted to see a miracle, and so I say to him, Gary, I got something to tell you, and I told him, and he threw a walker in front of me, and he said, "Show me." And I walked ten feet unassisted. He said, this is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in 25 years of physical therapy. And then he started to panic because he had to figure out how he was, he was going to explain to the insurance company ah, what has that's, now happened. That's funny. <laughs> that is fu- that's like there's a movie plot there. Yep. And so you How know, do we did. hide the miracle from the insurance company? He goes, he goes I know what I'm going to do. And he wrote, act of God. And he sent it into them. And that's what he did. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. So Gary saw his miracle. And so after this now, because I want to leap ahead, we'll yes. get you in most of hour two. We'll continue the conversation. But so a minute or two left, what, what, what happens after this point? So this is where the Lord really starts taking me through a very intense refining process of I'm going to take you from a wheelchair to the walker, from the walker to the cane, from the cane to nothing. And in the process, I'm going to refine you and bloom you prophetically and teach you discipline and stewardship in the process to prepare me for what was going to happen when I was 39 years old. So this was all this about five year process. Okay, and, what, and can you can you tell us in the in the minute and a half left what happened when you were 39 years old? What happened when I was 39 is after feeding ducks for two and a half years. The Lord yeah. made me do this every day, and you yeah, know this. I know this story. To yeah. teach me discipline. Yeah. He started sending all these animals to my house. He said to me, "Now you're ready." And he told me I, to start making videos. And that he can, I'm going, what am I going to say? Can you imagine an Italian asking the Lord, what am I going to say? We, yeah. We're never at a loss for words. Right. And he goes, I'll tell you what to say. Just do what I'm telling you to do. And so I did. At the age of 39, Ark of Grace so, was birthed. So during this whole period from when you have this miracle and these mm-hmm. years, and, you know, obviously, you know, you talk about the wilderness experience that you've yes. been through it. Mm-hmm. And to some extent, I have, too. I never really tell that story, but I just went through hell for years with my yep. health. But you really, really went through it. And so were you hearing from God during those years? Was he speaking yes. to you prophetically? Mm-hmm. He was. So as I'm walking down to fight to go feed the ducks, because it was a trek for me to go down to the pond on our property. Right. It's actually my godmother, Barbara, who said, the Lord is going to start sending all these animals and you're going to take care of them. And that's when two ducks became 80 ducks running all over our property and me feeding them. And so as I'm going back and forth twice a day and my husband thinks I'm crazy doing this, the Lord is speaking to me and he's refining me hearing him. My sheep know my voice and as strangers I will not follow. So every day I'm going down and he's calling. He's teaching me to know his voice. You you genuinely can't make this stuff up. No, you can't. You Mm -hmm. can't make it up. It's amazing. People have stories. Okay. Ark of Grace hyphen ministries.com. Ark of Grace hyphen ministries.com. Um, we're going to continue the conversation uh, in hour two with Amanda Grace. Hang on. Folks, I'm talking to a friend. Her name is Amanda Grace. Amanda, mm-hmm. your story, I mean, we haven't even gotten to the, um, you know, how God is speaking to you now. Mm-hmm constantly about giving you prophetic dreams and, and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff, which it's a lot of tough, it's tough for people to process, even yeah. tough for me to process sometimes mm-hmm. just because it's so, but I know it's real. And y- you've gotten to this point in your story where you said uh, at age 39, you've been through this unbelievably difficult process. Yes. And, but now God says, okay, you're ready to start and start making videos and, and, and speak what I'm speaking to yes. you. Yes, so he tells me to start making videos. At the same time, he starts sending more animals to the property. So he sent a lost Muscovy duck named Jake 
Dad. Now, was the duck named Jake before you no, met I him? No, I named him Jake. Oh. The Lord told me to name him Jake, so I named All him right. Jake. And he says, you see him? You're going to take care of him, too, every day. And so Chris actually built him a pen uh, because Jake was lost. I mean, Muscovy ducks are normally native to South America. People do have them up here in New York. Uh, but he was definitely lost. So I took on Jake, and Jake is what really started it all with the sanctuary and, and all of these lost animals either showing up or, or, or you know, right. finding us somehow. Uh, and so as this is happening and Jake comes and Daisy comes, who is a female Muscovy duck and a chicken named Jingles that was getting bullied, <laughs> that was funny too. So she shows up. So now the Lord has me taking care of them too, and he has me making videos. Okay. So now he has me start. Now, he had been warning me for a year and a half to get it through my thick Italian skull that, you know, I'm bringing you into a new arena. I'm taking you out of obscurity. Now, if I knew what that meant now, I would have hit under the bed and said, I'm not coming out. Like, that is what would have happened. Yeah. So he would tell me that, but he, would, he doesn't give you the whole because he knows what you can handle at yeah. that moment. So he yeah. gives you pieces. So I start making videos. And probably, that was February. So by June... All of a sudden, you know, 5,000, 10,000, it starts climbing and, 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 and people start finding out about me and the animals and the sanctuary. So I'm doing this through uh, 2018. It was 2018 when it started. Now, in 2018, the Lord says something to me, too, that I'm going to understand the fullness of what it means in 2019. At the beginning of the following year, your husband is going to have a road to Damascus moment in his life, and it's going to reroute and change everything in his life. So the Lord tells me this, and I write this down. And so I, the Lord is preparing the covering and preparing the way this entire time because he knows what's coming. So 2018, I started driving again, you know, I'm, which was miraculous after four years of not being able to. So I start driving. Um, I'm taking care of the animals. I'm doing the videos. I'm putting out the prophetic words that the Lord is giving me. Uh, and so I do this all the way through 2018, you know, disciplined. You know what I mean? I didn't give up on it. I just kept yeah. doing it. The Lord yeah. told me to do it. I just kept doing it. That was all I knew. So it was at the beginning of 2019, just as this starts, that, you know, that everything totally gets rocked in our lives which the, the prophecy the Lord gave me about Chris is now about to come to its fullness and so I can understand, you know, what he really meant. And that was at the beginning of January 2019 that, and to preface this, Chris, at the age of 17, had been in a snowmobile accident and had hit a wall at 60 miles an hour and he should have never lived. And the Lord spared his life. But Chris developed a brain injury from that accident that got swept under the rug. So I marry him, and I don't know he's got an actual brain injury from this accident, and he's got something growing in his brain calling, called an AVM, which stands for arterial venous malformation, and it's a cousin to an aneurysm. He doesn't even know he has and it. And this is going on for decades in his yes, life. Yes, decades in his life. And so when we got married, I noticed Chris had issues with logic sometimes and reason. Certain things I was like, "Some Lord, what's going on? Something's not right. And the Lord had said to me, your husband has a brain injury from the first accident, and I'm going to expose it, that, that this, this is what's going on. God told you this. He tells this me point. this. Yeah. About five years into our marriage, he tells me this. So it was January 8th, 2019, when he had left for work. And I, and I laugh in a way about our marriage because when, when the Lord allowed us to marry, he probably said, oy vey, you know, because he's a Jewish God. So he probably said, oy vey, to start and said and said, this is going to look like a hot mess at the beginning, but it's going to turn out well on the back end. You know, I could see the Lord just saying this, you know, from his throne. So Chris goes to work, and by the grace of God, he chooses to go, which I knew is the Holy Spirit, to the, to the house of a woman that had been a nurse for 20 years. And Coincidence, <clears throat> they ask? Uh, mm -hmm. So what happens at that house? So, <clears throat> and to preface this, three days prior... And I know your friend, Mr. Ken Fish, will know exactly what I'm talking about. I felt a shift happen in the spirit when I was in the kitchen, and I knew. And I turned to Chris, and I said to him, there's a bomb that's about to go off in your family. I don't know where, but I know it's going to go off. Because I, I felt the shift. I felt it happen. So I'm starting to pray three days prior, embracing myself. 
So about 2.30 p.m., his employee, Antonio, races right onto the lawn, drives right onto the grass, doesn't even care at this point, and comes running to the door. You have to call Vassar Hospital. Chris collapsed. So I call Vassar, and the doctor says to me, Mrs. Wagner, because Amanda Grace Wagner, your husband is in grave condition. He has had an enormous hemorrhagic stroke. The AVM started to bleed, and we are prepping him for emergency brain surgery, and we need you up here. So the Lord told me two things, because in the middle of a crisis, if you check your emotions for a minute and listen for the Lord, he's, he will instruct you. He will. So he told me I had to take anointing oil, and I had to get to him before surgery because I was going to jump in the gap and plead for his life as his wife. So we get up there minutes before he's going to go into surgery. And I walk into the room, and he's twitching on a ventilator. So this is my first sight of him. And the Lord is saying to me, the Lord is speaking to me while I'm in there, put this out of your mind. Don't look at what you see right now. Focus on what I told you to do. So I anoint him. And I said, anybody that doesn't want to come into an agreement with this, out of the room now. I didn't want the extra warfare. So I said, out of the room. And I prayed. And in that prayer, some of the things that were said is, I rebuke the devourer in the name of Jesus Christ. And I said, you have no right to his life. Um, I asked the Lord to send his holy angels of all rankings and divisions to protect the operation. And at the end of the prayer, I said, Lord, I'm holding you to your word that Chris is going to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. So, because God is bound by his word. So I said, I'm holding you to your word. And he goes into surgery. Now, Dr. Shannon, who was an incredibly talented neurosurgeon, said, Amanda, I'm going to try, but nobody survives this. And I thought, that is not your call, Dr. Shannon. That is the Lord's call right now. You go in there and you do what you need to do. So he goes in and he comes out two and a half hours later. Now, something interesting happened. I didn't find out till 10 days later, which I'll tell you. He says, he looks like a deer in headlights, and he goes, he survived. Two blood transfusions, um, almost lost him once, but he survived. And he says, the next three days are going to determine whether he lives or dies. And I thought, well, Jesus was in the tomb dead for three days, so the Lord is prepping for something incredible to happen here. I find out from his sister, 10 days later, which is important to what happened in that operating room, his sister, he's got two sisters, who's, right? Whose sister? Chris's sister. Chris's he sister. has two sisters. Yeah. Carol, I, I laugh. I say she's not from the same gene pool because she was adopted. So Carol's got a completely different personality right. than the rest of them. And so Carol is not one to say she saw things. She never. Right. She called me and she says, Amanda, everyone's going to think I'm crazy. I, I, I don't know who else to go to. I have to tell you. She said, because Carol was so broken in the waiting room when this was going on. She said, when I was in the waiting room, a picture appeared before my face. She had an open vision for the first time in her life during this. She said, and I saw Chris on the operating table, and I saw Dr. Shannon, and I saw these enormous angels standing shoulder to shoulder protecting the entire operation. So the angels I asked God to dispatch were dispatched. They were there, and Carol saw them. So I find that out 10 days later, but that's pertinent because they were sent to protect that operation and make sure that the enemy did not interfere in what was happening. So they tell me during this three days, we have to move him to Westchester Medical Center because we couldn't even touch the aneurysm part of it or the AVM. And if it ruptures, it's going to kill him. So we need to move him on a ventilator, which is very risky stuff to move a patient on a ventilator. They have to send in a special team that's been trained, and it's a big brouhaha. So I signed the release for them to move him, and they move him. And Dr. Santarelli comes out, and he looked like Doogie Hauser. He looked like he was 16 years old, and I'm looking around for the cameras like, this is the guy that's going to do the surgery of the AVM for my husband. And so he did. He looked like he was 16. It was the weirdest thing. So he comes out, and he asked me a question. And he said, Amanda, I've been looking at your husband's records, but I don't see anything about an accident. Did your husband have an accident? Okay, hang on. We'll be right back with the rest of the story, talking Mm -hmm. to Amanda Grace. Talking to Amanda Grace, you can find her at arcofgrace-ministries.com. So Amanda... You're telling us that 
this was this is so recent this is 2019 mm -hmm. and they move chris and you say this incredibly young doctor comes out and asks you mm -hmm. did your husband ever have an yeah. accident mm -hmm. and and I said, yes, and I explained to him what happened when Chris was 17 and everything. And he said, now this all makes sense. He goes, I couldn't find it in the chart. I couldn't figure it out because this type of AVM only comes from a prior trauma to the brain. Right. So now here's, it's all coming out. Chris has a brain injury. He has a brain injury from the first accident. What the Lord had said to me years ago, now this is all coming out on the and table. Yeah, you didn't get that until now. Yes. You didn't understand. Uh, yes. Okay. And so now he tells me they're going to try to get this all in one shot. They basically have to take glue and block off every single vessel right. that is feeding the AVM. Right. Uh, and so he says, we're going to try to get in one shot. I don't think we're going to, but we're going to try. So he comes out an hour and a half later and he goes, we got it all, which was miraculous. And now Chris is in a coma. He's not only in a coma, he's got no skull on his left side because in quick thinking, Dr. Shannon, because the brain was swelling, took the skull off, made a slit and put it near his stomach and sewed it up because Dr. Shannon said bone needs blood to live. And I thought you could do a whole preaching just on that, just off of what Dr. Shannon said to me. Bone he needs blood to live. He did this to preserve the bone, the part of the bone of, from his skull yes. so that it could mm -hmm. be reattached at some point. Yes, in quick Whoa. thinking because they didn't have time to prep anything. So this was a very emergency situation, yeah. and this is what Dr. Shannon did. Right. And so five days later, he wakes up from the coma, unable to speak a lick, completely mentally. When people wake up from brain injuries, they are hostile because their brain is so confused. <sighs> So now Chris, and Chris doesn't remember this, but Chris has taken swings at everybody because, and he's a big guy at that point. You know what I mean? Like Chris was a builder. So uh, it w he was in the neuro ICU. He couldn't speak a lick. So he couldn't speak. He couldn't even say the word no. He was very confused. But what happened was when they did bring him out of it, I got there minutes after they brought him out of the coma and it was successful. I looked at him. And he, he looked up at me and he squeezed my hand. So he recognized me. He may have not known the association, but he knew me. Uh, and so that's when the days after that, he got very hostile and agitated because that's what the brain does when the brain has been scrambled like this. And so, and he's paralyzed on his right side. He can't use his right side at that point. And so this is the battle now to try, this is going to be the, you know, this battle experience of going to war to try to bring Chris, you know, back. Because they told me he was going to be a vegetable in the wheelchair, their words, not mine. And I thought if doctors spoke more life over their patients, gee, I wonder what would happen in hospitals. Yeah, I, I say, wonder that, what would that happen guy if over they there, did this. I think they got that one wrong. They, uh, they did. They um, got it very wrong. Wow. And so he gets transferred to a rehab in Rockland County. And so in New York, and he is there five months trying to learn how to walk and When talk. I think what you went through, mm -hmm. and then now he went through, it's, yep. uh, it's almost unbelievable what you guys have been through. And I'm facing this as a wife going, you know what I mean? My husband, it's like the, it's like the first Chris died. And there's a brand new Chris, and he's nothing like the first Chris. So right. I, I got married again right away yeah. to somebody totally different. Yeah. And I remember when he first got to Helen Hayes, the Lord did a creative miracle. The Lord will do that. He'll equip you with what you need in the middle of the battle if you're open to receiving it. And he, he couldn't talk, and he was very frustrated. And he was drawing something, and it looked like a pair of pants in a box. I, I, it was like I had no clue. He's getting frustrated. He's pointing at it. He's getting upset. And I very simply said, Lord... If I can't understand him, I can't help him. Like very simple prayer of a child. And the Holy Spirit almost chuckling says to me, he wants to know where his wallet is. And I looked at him, I said, are you asking me where your wallet is? And he threw the pen down and put his hands up in the air, hallelujah, because somebody finally understood him. And from that day forward, even though he couldn't say any words, I understood him. And they couldn't believe it. They actually asked me, are you sure this accident just happened? Because you just understand him way too well for this just being so new. But that was... So God miraculously helped you to understand what he's trying to communicate, even yes. though it mm -hmm. makes no human sense. Made no human sense. I can understand it. 
to in order to equip me to help him. So he was there five months. He had to wear a special helmet because he had no skull on one side. The first word he learned in rehab was no. <laughs> and so that was fun. And I was there every day pretty much. Every day I, I was going there and, and involved in the rehab and he was asking. He was asking for sushi three times a week. I knew. I knew the noise that he made when he wanted sushi. So he's asking for this three times a week, and I'm like, well, this is good for his brain, so I don't mind getting it for him. So you know, I, I would come with what he asked for, and I'd have to take care of the house and make sure people were taking care of our dogs because we had Roxy now, and Toby at that point. Are you still making prophetic videos at this point? Yes, through the whole. I publicly went through this. Battle. So everything I had been teaching and talking about, I was going to have to walk out publicly now for people to watch me do it. And so I publicly walked through this whole battle and I gave updates the entire way. And I still prophesied the entire way because the Lord didn't release me from the first. So I still had to do it because he hadn't released me and told me, oh, it's OK to put it right. to the side. So now I'm doing both. I'm giving update videos on Chris. And I have to tell you, people from all over the country, the amount of prayer and cards and quilts and gifts I and support just, was overwhelming. Okay, final segment uh, for today. We'll continue tomorrow or in the next day, but we'll be right back. I've been talking to uh, Amanda Grace about her husband, Chris. Remember that guy we keep talking about named Chris? And I thought, wouldn't it be a swell idea to bring Chris onto the set? And look! Here he is, Chris. Welcome to the program. Oh, I want to shake your you. hand, man. I know you. We <laughs> know you. each other, but I'm just so glad that my audience can see you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you. I don't know where do we take this story from here. I don't know. Well, it was uh, we, Chris didn't come home for for good until November of 2019. Basically, he had developed epilepsy from the scar on the brain, oh and he gosh. went back into that. He had a massive seizure. I had to call 911. He wasn't responding to me right. This was September 2019. Chris, is she just making this up? Is this true? I think uh, I think so. <laughs> yes. I mean, come on. Epilepsy? Epilepsy. And so... It's unbelievable. Yes, I seriously... Go back to rehab. Guys, what you guys have been through. I, mm -hmm. I really... I think a lot of people listening to this program, it's hard to take it in mm -hmm. what what and and how you love god mm -hmm. because there's so many people if something goes wrong they're like i blame god like oh yeah well a lot of people go through a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and they praise god because they realize how much he loves us and he mm -hmm. we don't understand why he lets us go through these things that's kind of the mystery yeah. but okay so epilepsy yeah. yes and he actually goes to a subacute rehab in Cortland manor new york now we have taken in this ties in <clears throat> another animal at the time Noble the orphaned baby pig. This pig is famous. Yeah, he if is. Noble is famous. Anybody follows you yes, yes. on on your YouTube channel. Yes, this is a famous pig. Yes, and so we take him in, and he's about eight pounds. He's he's so tiny, and so Chris That's goes back in. That's the best eating size, by the way. I just want to be very <laughs> Eric, <clear. laughs> I had this. How could I resist that? That was like so. I'm totally off pork now. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. So. I get this wild idea that I'm going to bring Noble down to the nursing home to visit all the patients. So I cleared it with them. They thought it was a great idea. It is. A, it sounds like a great idea. So Noble's probably about this big now. Like he's, I don't know, maybe like 30 pounds by the time. By you know, the time you bring him to this yes, rehab. rehab. And I have him on his little harness and I, we brought him down at Christmas time too. When Chris got out in November, we went back down. I actually had a custom Christmas tux made for him to put on him. And we had jingle bells and we went and visited all the patients and noble was he was their therapy he went up to them they'd pet him uh he was very he knew he the pigs have the intelligence of a four-year-old child so when we got there he knew i have to go into every room i have to visit every patient he knew this and we did this many times with noble um in the midst of chris getting out of this yeah. subacute rehab and going back down with him to visit the patients that that were still there uh, and that was at the end of 2019. Now, Chris permanently comes home then, and my life changes dramatically because now the Lord had set this up so I could do the broadcast from home. This was all the brilliance of God setting everything up, um, setting up me broadcasting at home for what we were about to go through in this country. Right. Uh, and so it, it, kind of I was able to take care of him and still do what the Lord wanted me to do the way the Lord set it up. So he comes home. We start in therapy. Chris 
needs help showering even when he gets home. So when he gets home, my life totally changes, and now I'm the caretaker. So I have a unique perspective. I've been both the patient yeah. and the caretaker. Yeah. So I understand it from both perspectives. And the battle is now to get Chris to, you know what I mean? The, the, the peak of where the Lord wants him, because I brought him back to Dr. Shannon when this was all said and done when he got out in November. He looked at me and he goes, Amanda, I don't like to use the word miracle because neurosurgeons never do. They're not built that way. It's very embarrassing. It's very embarrassing for them. He goes, but I don't know what else to call this. He said, this is an absolute miracle. He goes, people Mm. don't survive this. And I said, they do if God says they do, Dr. Shannon. If the Lord speaks it, they do. And he, he, he says, I can't even wrap my head around the fact your husband can walk. And so it was a testimony to him and his father. His father was also a neurosurgeon, threw his hands up in the air, went, the man's a walking miracle. I don't know what else to say. Like, they were just baffled by by his recovery. And Chris has gotten better and better, praise God. His speech has dramatically improved. Um, you know, Chris can do, you know, quite a few things himself now, you know, as, as I mean, far we've as had, life. I mean, we've had conversations, you know, small conversations, but you've come to hear me preach at the church mm-hmm. in Bethel a few times. and yes. And it is once you hear the story, it's the it's just more amazing to me that you're you're just showing up and you know mm-hmm. and obviously you're still struggling, mm-hmm. but it's um it, it is, I mean I I say this just because there are many people out there who need hope, they don't believe God does miracles, he they does. don't believe they can't they can't you know or they say oh you never do anything for me, and it's like no that's that's we we need to have faith first of all that god loves us and that whatever he does turn to him and let him do whatever he's going to do i mean he lets sometimes he lets us go through hell you guys have been through hell Mm -hmm. Uh, i've been through stuff nothing like this but i mean that the question is are you walking with him in the middle of it are you looking to him in the middle of it are you realize he's the author of when you live and die he is the one that's how you're going to get through the valley yeah is looking up And, and focusing on him through it. That's how you get through the valley. Otherwise, you'll wander there for 40 years in the desert if you keep taking your eyes off yeah. of him. So it was crucial for me to keep my eyes on the Lord because I knew there was no way I was going to be able to do any of this without the Lord's grace, wisdom, and strength on me and leading me and guiding me in this because this was heavy. And I, I felt the weight of it. I could feel the weight of the heaviness between the ministry and, and taking care of Chris and the sanctuary, you know, and, and the Lord didn't stop sending animals when Chris came home, which was a whole adjustment for Chris because the Lord didn't stop sending them, <laughs> you know, so that's a whole other part of our story. Um, before we go, we'll have one final uh, segment um, with Chris and Amanda, but I just want to remind people, if you haven't done it yet, please go to SocratesInTheCity.com sign up for the live stream. You, I mean, if you want to show up in New York, show up. But if you can't, sign up for the live stream. We've never done a live stream before with Socrates uh, in, in the city, and I'm, I'm so excited about it, I could, I could burst. And I think tomorrow, Alvin, we're going to be airing uh, Jeannie Constantinou. We're going to be airing a little bit of that tomorrow, and she will be my guest at Socrates in the City, which is on February 28th. But you can watch it live, and you can have your own Socrates in the City party at home. The uh, fancy hors d'oeuvres and the wine are not included in the streaming price. I'm just just letting you know. But you can stream it and you can have your own Socrates event wherever you want. Uh, So I just had to say that. I also want to remind you, um, one of our new sponsors on the program, I want to make sure that I get the website right, Uh, it's holyland.israel.com. Dot travel. I have been to Israel. I'm planning to go back to Israel. Holy Land. Israel. Travel. Final segment with Amanda Grace and that guy we were talking about, her husband Chris, sitting right here. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm just. But when, when, when you hear the story of what you went through, mm-hmm. and Chris is taking care of you, and then what Chris has been through, and you're taking care of Chris, and now God is with you in the whole thing. It's just an amazing story, and we're still in the middle of the story because, you know, there's so much more. Mm-hmm. And you, <clears throat> but the fact that this happened when this country basically went insane. Yes, it, yeah. The COVID lunacy, mm-hmm. the government lying to us, election fraud, wherever you want to go with it, everything went insane. And you were processing this 
with your YouTube online audience while this is going on. Chris is home. Mm-hmm. You've got the animals. I mean, it's yes. like, it's, it's amazing timing. It, it was incredible timing. He, the timing of God is, is so amazing. And Chris came home literally on the cusp of everything going insane. So at least I had him at home. Uh, and, but the Lord had brilliantly set this up when he told me to start making videos and now praise God. I mean, we've, you know what I mean? The Lord has just grown us and and we're very grateful to the Lord for that. Mm. But when he told me to start making the videos, he was setting me up for all of that because I didn't miss a beat. I went through the whole craziness prophesying and, and and speaking the word of the Lord and teaching right through it. Mm. It it never got disrupted. So praise God for that. Well, it's a, it's amazing. I want you to stick around Mm -hmm. so we can do another show to talk about what God's been saying to you prophetically. Um, so we'll do that, uh, in the, in the next, in the next show. But, um, let me just ask you one, just one final question, because I'm sure people are wondering, what is it about animals? In other words, what is your sense? Because one of my dear friends, John Zmirak, he's on this program every week. He has this thing, he rescues the two beagles, and he has this love for these animals. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what is it about animals that you, that it's such an important part of your life? Or what do you think it is about animals? Well, I think the Lord appropriately named it Ark of Grace. I think that has a dual meaning because the Lord sent all the animals so it is to the like ark Noah. to be saved. Right. And Jesus is our ark. He was our covering uh, on the cross. And so basically it does have a dual meaning. Animals taught me stewardship and being faithful and taking care of something that really couldn't do much back for me. You know, we could never, ever repay God, ever. You know, that's his unconditional love for us. And so these animals taught me that, but the Lord showed me that Ark of Grace is a reflection of the heart of God because the same way he finds us in our broken, abandoned, you know, neglected state, and he goes, I can work with that. I can work with this person. We get these animals in broken, neglected, abandoned, disabled states, and I go, I can work with that animal. I know we can pull something special out of this animal. It's just, it's just amazing that mm-hmm. God has given you the desire to do that. Um, so we, we've got less than a minute left. So name some of the animals. You mentioned Noble the yes. Pig, who's famous. Yes, we have Moses the sheep, who was actually born on Passover last mm-hmm. year, and the Lord sent us a lamb born on Passover to the sanctuary for us to raise. Um, we have uh, Simeon, his little friend, the deer. <laughs> Simeon the deer, who was abandoned by his mother. Yes, we have a wildlife rehabilitator specialist involved in this, you know, but we are really? a sanctuary. Wow. So we have him. We have Molly and Wally, the two African gray parrots that were each sent at 40 years old. God has a brilliant sense of humor. Parrots aged 40? Yes, because they live past 60 years in captivity, and they have the intelligence of a five-year-old child. And so I've got Wally the parrot walking around with the cats and the pig, Duchess the pig, which is his little girlfriend, and the dogs, and he goes, hey, Hey, hello, you know what I mean? And he says hi to all the animals. And then we have Noble, who everybody knows. Now, people, we're out of time. Uh-huh. So people, if they want to know more, <laughs> they can go to arcofgrace-ministries.com. And uh, you have a YouTube channel. Chris and Amanda, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Eric. We love Eric. you. We love you and your wife. Yes. Love you back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey there, folks. Welcome back. You remember my friend Amanda Grace, remember? From the old neighborhood, she's back right here. Amanda Grace, welcome back. Thank you. I just uh, last time you were on, you told your whole amazing story. My gosh, it's very mm-hmm. hard to take in, but God speaks through you prophetically, mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't even understand what does that mean. It's confusing because there are many people who claim to speak prophetically who express that in really different ways, Mm -hmm. right? You get some people saying, oh, I got caught up into heaven, and they tell this story, or Mm -hmm. they say, God told me this, or told me this, told me this. And I think there's a lot of skepticism, because I think it's very tempting for somebody with a gift like that to just kind of embellish Mm -hmm. or or, or whatever. And it's obviously important, because we're talking about holy stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when God says something, it's so holy. So you... um, when you hear from God, how does that how does that work? Because most people, I think more people have had spiritual experiences and they're kind of afraid to talk about it. But what you're talking about is very 
it's an incredible gift that you've had since you were a little kid and mm -hmm. it's been honed through decades. Yes. So at this point, um, because I want to get into like specifics of what th some things God's been saying to you, but w how do you quote unquote hear from God or is it a whole number of ways? Uh, it, it is a few ways. So one of them is, you know, we're vessels. So obviously we get, we can get filled up because we're a vessel. You know, if a cup like you're drinking here, we're drinking is a vessel, right? It gets filled with water and then it, you can pour it out. So when I go into prayer a lot, and I'll get on my face before the Lord, I have no qualms about doing that. I can feel the Lord actually filling me up with what he once said, and I type it. That's one of the ways. Other way is, you know, the Spirit of the Lord hits me and my mouth takes off like a rocket, which Italians do very well. So the Lord took that Italian explosiveness and just harnessed it in the right, you know, more in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, dreams also, since I'm a kid, I've been a dreamer. So the Lord will speak to me, uh, you know, in I dreams. forgot about that. You also, mm -hmm. you also get dreams. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you're, you're very, uh, you know, as we said in the, the show where you tell your story, you've been so humbled uh, through difficulty uh, mm -hmm. in your own life and with your husband Chris's life. You've been through so much, and, but you have a sense of joy, and you're very real, mm -hmm. and you're fun. And for me... That's very important, that people are fun. They have this, you know, a joy. Not everybody is is like that. We can't all be Matt Walsh. <laughs> you know, no, but I'm saying some people are just, they're serious, and they're supposed to be. But you are wonderfully uh, light and, and fun. Actually, Suzanne and I, when we when, when our friend Joel Tucheron told us to check you out, I think my favorite thing when I realized we got to listen to this woman was when you said, I'll never forget it, because you had your camera set up and you're in your in your bedroom and you got the animals around and stuff and you're you're doing your thing. <laughs> I told you this last time. You said that you're going like this. You're going like this. And you say, "Don't you hate it when a fly gets into the bed, bed into the bedroom and you can't get it out?" <laughs> and I said, "Not a lot of people would share that. They would just kind of pretend like there's no fly." But you were honest with your audience. You say, don't you hate it when a fly gets into the bedroom and in your New York accent? I said, that's why I want to listen to this person because she's a normal person with a gift. So, all right, so you get dreams, you get these visions, mm -hmm. whatever. All right, so let's start here. What has God said to you more recently about where we are in the nation or, or anything you want to share? But that's really what I want to know. Well, there, there, there's a few things the Lord has been saying. So one of them I had talked to you about when we were all out to breakfast after Bethel at that amazing Greek diner. Not Bethel, not Bethel, Connecticut, not, no. not, not Bethel, Redding, California, no, not no, Bethel no, Church, no, no. Bethel, Connecticut, yes. his vineyard, the church, his vineyard in Bethel, Connecticut. Wonderful church. So it's just, yes, wonderful mm -hmm. church. And so... Yeah, you share, you, so share that. Go ahead. So I had started talking to Eric about what the, the Lord had this very um, pull no punches words for the shepherds about, and, and even the Christian universities, about giving um, the young and, and giving, you know, the, 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 the flock of their church stale bread, sour wine, old wineskins. That is what you're feeding them right now. Okay, now let's translate this. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if I'm tracking, because I, I think this came out of a conversation mm -hmm. you and I were having. Mm -hmm. What I was saying was that, I mean, wherever I go and preach, I mean, I was in California recently. Mm -hmm. I, I'm always saying, I'm talking about the message of my book, Letter to the American Church, which is effectively that now is the time for the church to stand and to... Um, to understand that now is the time to fight. Now, this is not 1985 where we can pretend like, oh, we've got two parties and everything's fine and we don't want to be political. We've got There's a time, and I talk about Bonhoeffer, yes. that he was mm -hmm. trying to tell the church. Now, he didn't hear prophetically, but clearly he was a prophet and he was hearing from God that now is the time for the church to stand against this evil yes. and to pretend mm -hmm. it's not there or to pretend it's not our job or to pretend whatever that you're not hearing what God is saying now because God is alive. And there are plenty of churches, and this is what I assume what you're talking about, that they're acting like, well, we're just going to go back to before the crazy and we're going to do church and we're not going to get in. And, and you think, well, what, do you understand the times you're living in? If you were silent now, 
that's a nightmare. There are people starving for truth to understand what is happening in the country. And they go, and the pastor kind of preaches a nice, you know, message. It's, it's, it's biblical, but it's not what God is speaking now. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like when you tell your kid, did you wash the car like I asked you? He's like, no, but I took out the trash. He's like, well, here's the problem. I didn't ask you to take the trash. I asked you to wash the car. You know, like taking the trash is a nice thing, mm-hmm. but that's not what I asked you. And I, kinda, I feel that what God is saying to the church in America now is you need to wake up, you need to stand, and you need to be uh, v- vocal and active against the evil that's happening. Yes. Don't just pretend it's not happening like that's yep. not my job. So when you gave me that mm-hmm. word, that's how I interpret it. Yes, and, and this is a First Kings chapter 18 moment where it's saying to the Church of America, how long will you falter between two opinions? How long will you falter between two opinions? If God is God, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. But how long will you falter? And it says, the next verse says, and the people spoke not a word. They stayed silent in the middle of being asked that very valley of decision. So so in a way, that's the point, right? Is that the Lord says, either follow Baal or follow me, which is it? Mm-hmm. When you are silent, you are choosing Baal. You are. That's the point. It's like they think that they're saying, well, we're not, we know a safe choice. We're not going to mm-hmm. choose. And God says, no, if you, you know, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. That's not from mm-hmm. scripture, but the principle. So you're telling me that God has spoken that to you in, in the particular, in, the, in those words that you gave about that, that the pastors are, they're feeding their flocks Stale Stale bread, bread, sour wine, and old wineskins, which is not the meat. They're giving them everything but the meat, but they're giving them what's stale and sour and no good for them and can make them sick. And this is, spiritually speaking, which is connected to our bodies anyway, but this is what they're feeding them. And some of them, and I know you've made this point, are are being like the 12,000 in Germany, that said, oh, we're not going to say anything. We'll just see how this plays out. Right. We'll just stand on the sidelines while you guys beat each other up. And you're thinking, oh, so you, you're going to avoid the battle. Well, God kind of grades that as helping the enemy mm-hmm. if there's a battle. Um, and w- so I don't know if you can speak to this of where you s- see things going in the next year or two. Cause, and, I, and I want you, I don't want to put words in your mouth. And I don't want, you know, mm-hmm. to, it just. Has God spoken things to you about that, or do you just have a sense in the natural? We're we're on the cusp and a precipice of where you've got this very um, hostile, resisting, and interlocking beginning to take place, where it says, resist the enemy and he shall flee with you, and that's a very hostile word, resisting. So what I'm seeing is this, and this is where it's going to have to be toppled. And I think it's going to, you're really going to have to see the corner turn before 2024. But you have the three ancient false gods that caused Israel to fall. Their names were Baal, Molech, and Ishtar. I'm going to focus on Ishtar for a minute, okay? Ishtar, the temple, one of the hubs was in Nineveh. That's why God wanted to destroy Nineveh. This particular spirit, the way it ran its temple, is it had, you know, the temple, we'll call them liaisons, okay, the women, you know, but they had male priests that were allowed to dress up as women, practice homosexuality, acted non-binary. This is not a new idea. This is thousands of years You're, old. This is not a new idea. So jo- they we're referencing mm-hmm. Jonathan Kahn's book, Return mm-hmm. to the Gods. I mean, this is amazing the way you just put it. Well, we got plenty more with Amanda Grace. We'll pick that up when we come back. Welcome back. We're talking to Amanda Grace. You can find her at arcofgrace-ministries.com. Okay, Amanda, so mm-hmm. you're talking about uh, what Jonathan Kahn mm-hmm. has talked about. Even Naomi Wolf on this program was talking about mm-hmm. when you turn away from the God of the Bible, whether you admit it or not, you are turning to other gods, which is to say to these Mm -hmm. extremely powerful demonic entities. And you referenced Ishtar. Yes, who is also known as Asherah. Right. And the way the temple worked is that 
these liaisons, and I'm using a nice word here, okay, would have these, these are temple prostitutes. Yes, that's what they are. Yeah, would have money thrown in their lap to perform illicit things that would bring what prosperity, reign to the land that they would prosper if they did this. Look at the full court press this particular spirit has just made on the younger generation in this nation. Look at the Grammys. Look at the Super Bowl. Look at the temple prostitutes that are having money thrown in their lap to perform illicit things to show the younger we can, you can prosper this way. This is the way you need to go. And it's making a full court press. At the same time I see, I see this happening, I see a spring beginning to bubble up in Asbury. And I'm calling it a spring because you need two things before revival happens. You need repentance and renewal. Repenting and then the renewing of the heart back to God, and that brings revival. So I see this bubbling, and Asbury happens to mean a fortified place. That's the meaning of Asbury. I look, The Lord had me look it up, so that's what the meaning is. So in the midst of all of this, you see this percolating beginning to happen. And I remember saying, it was months ago, that the younger generation is very passionate and committed. It's just to the wrong things. And once you see them begin to turn, watch out for what's going to happen in this nation because they are going to turn and wake up and turn on these very false gods and these very ideologies and this very wokeism that they've been fed. Wokeism isn't a new thing. It happened in Mesopotamia. This was all birthed back in those pagan nations. What these, what these rulers of the darkness did is they reinvented themselves to feed themselves to modern day man, basically to make it palatable to modern day man. So I see this full court press happening as we are racing towards 2024, which is no accident that this is happening now. But I also see this bubbling and this percolating begin to happen. This spring now begin to bubble up that we have seen happen. That's just the beginning of it. That, that I'm going to call Asbury the catalyst for what's coming. Right. That's what it is. I, I think you're right, and I think that part of what, what I see is that God in his mercy allows things to get very bad to wake mm -hmm. certain people up. In other words, there's, this, there's a holy remnant that's being awakened that, you know, if everything were sort of fine, they would mm -hmm. just kind of continue sleepwalking. But this, these, these things that have happened are so outrageous that even if you're not a person of Christian faith, you're looking around thinking, what is happening? It's like people are going crazy, but you don't know what to say about it or you don't know what to, and so it's the job of the church to clarify, yes, this is what this is. Mm -hmm. This is evil. Uh, this is not normal. It's not, you can't redefine these things just because somebody said you could, but the aggressiveness of mm -hmm. it is what I think is waking some people up. They're thinking, this is just not... Because this is know. an aggressive, destroying spirit you're dealing with. This spirit is highly aggressive. It is ruthless in its approach. And you have to treat it like that. You know, you can't, you can't treat it. You have to know your opponent and what you're dealing with. This is an incredibly ruthless... And if we don't think that golden statue that just went atop the New York City courthouse isn't connected to this, we have another thing coming because it is. You're, you're, it is. You're talking about that really creepy... I mean... The thing is, I think in the past, I, years ago or whatever, I just would have said, oh, whatever, you know, whatever. Yep. It is. But now and now, more and more, <laughs> I'm seeing like, oh, my goodness, this is, it's an astonishing thing. You know, These the, are really happening. Mm -hmm. And one of the articles said, move over, Moses. There's a, there's a new lawmaker in town. Now, she was seen, Ishtar or Asherah, as overseeing divine law. So really, the spirit is trying to elevate itself to be equal to the laws of God. It, it is really making a full court press. And in a way, it's trying to turn New York City into Nineveh. Because first you had the Arch of Baal. Now you got this statue showing up where the law is and asserting itself. And it has very strange qualities, A, that are a little too similar, eerily similar to Ishtar, if you look at a picture yeah. depiction. Secondly, the braids. I'm going to point out the braids for a minute. The braids go down like a ram's horn almost, which is a mockery. Okay? So the braids now, literally I, look like a ram's horn. First of all, like just so people horn. understand what we're talking about, someone created a sculpture, which is on the top of the New York courthouse here in Manhattan. Yes. Okay. Who, do we know who created this? Like, what, why, and why is it there? The, 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 it's associated, I, I don't know if it's the, the artist's name or the company, Hava, which is to be, to just be, that's what the name means. 
Um, and w- we're not sure why, but I'll tell you what's interesting about that statue going atop the courthouse now, because there is a 16 foot tall statue uh, of the same kind in Madison Square Park, and then there is an eight foot one that went atop the New York City courthouse. In 1838, the legislator of New York declared openly that this is a Christian nation. New York, in 1838, declared this, the legislator, that, that, that 99, it said 100 of the people, it, they believed it. It was just very, and that we were not meant to serve the few that don't agree. That, that's the basis of their speech. So they openly declare this, and then we wonder why the enemy sent his sights on New York to become a hub, to become the carotid artery to Washington, D.C., because that's what it is. It feeds Holy it. Holy cow. All yep, right, hang on. We've is. got more with Amanda Grace. Don't go away. Talking to Amanda Grace. Amanda, you, you, I mean, we're sharing some dark, mm-hmm. crazy stuff. That So they put this sculpture atop the New York courthouse state courthouse here in new york Mm -hmm. in the city and it is at least pagan i mean we know it's demonic Mm -hmm. but it's at least pagan and you kind of think why do they do that what is that Mm -hmm. well you can see its hallmarks it it, it, because they want to be worshipped so bad they tend to spring up in different areas at once like you know that you can connect the dots and if you notice and you can look this up at the Grammys, Madonna came out with the same golden, long, circling braids that this statue has. So there's a connection there, you know? Um, And so Ishtar was the counterpart to Baal. So first the Arch of Baal shows up in New York, and now... This now, people, a lot of people don't up. know about that. Talk mm-hmm. about the Arch of Baal showing up in New York. So, oh my gosh, I, I, I forgot what year it happened. It was years ago it happened. But a replica of the Arch of Baal that was... It's that, not that many years ago. No, it wasn't that long ago, but it was quite a few years, maybe six years ago, maybe, yeah, or so. Yeah. The, the Arch of Baal, a replica of it, which was the entrance into the Temple of Baal, I believe, which is yeah, what it was, yeah. shows up on exhibit in New York City. Yeah. Shows up out of nowhere, and they put it on display in New York. So those are the first alarm bells when this happens. Like, even when I saw that happen, I well, knew. Well, even if you don't believe in any of this stuff, you just have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, like, the people who put these things up originally, like thousands mm-hmm. of years ago when they created the Arch of Baal, they knew that this had dark, dark spiritual power. Yes. They weren't just being mm-hmm. decorative. These no. had spiritual power. No, they, and, it, and interestingly enough, you know, Baal was associated with the bull, and you've got the statue of the bull that's not far from there, and also a bull market when it comes to the stock market and prospering and the whole deal. Uh, and so he, this arch shows up first. It actually hit key points around the world. This arch happened to travel a bit. Right. So after this shows up, um, now we have... The counterpart, it seems, showing up atop the courthouse. Now, why New York also? I will tell you why, too. Because the battle for abortion started in New York. I believe it was 1970. Ishtar, or Asherah, associated with fertility, divine law, and prosperity. So there it is, fertility. So where does it want to plant itself? Back where the battle began after Roe v. Wade overturned and did what they did. So I don't find it any accident we see this happening now. And we all see this, too, racing towards Purim, which is March 6th and 7th. So we see all these events happening, bam, 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 one after the other, as we are approaching Purim on the Jewish calendar in the month of Adar. Do do you have a sense, uh, because I've heard a number of prophetic voices say that uh, Biden will not finish his term do, do you have any sense of that? You know, I remember the Lord had given me a dream at the beginning of January 2021, and I remember he was very ill in bed. And standing at the head of the bed, to his le- it would be to his left if he was laying down, was Barack Obama. And I remember there were a bunch of these people dressed like they come from the United Arab Emirates, gathered around the bed with Obama waiting because it was obvious he was he was very unwell. It was obvious that it looked like something was going to happen. And I remember they had a piece 
of apricot candy known as Turkish delight on the bed. Now, when, when Muslims want to celebrate the death of their enemies or, or a very crucial death, they, they celebrate by passing out candy many times. Like, this is part of their culture. So this candy is on the bed. So I'm there, and I fight through this crowd. In the dream. In the dream. And I snatch the candy away from them, and I take it from them. Um, and, I, and I basically ate it myself so they couldn't have it. And I woke up. <laughs> and what <laughs> so do you think that dream. means? What? Well, if I represent the people in the dream and I also represent the prophetic mantle, it is truly the Lord who is sending, you know, in the prophets right now to speak forth because the nation is at stake. You see what I mean? So I fought through to take that away from them because they were ready to celebrate their little plan was going to work. The plan to take Biden out so they could do even more nefarious I think, things. yes, a plan to try to find some way of ushering him out or segueing him out or doing something. Not that we're pro-Biden. Uh, it's just kind of, yeah, it's just so dark what, what, is, what is happening. And, uh, uh, and what do you make of the fact that a lot of prophets like, were emphatic that Trump was going to be, was going to have this term? Obviously, that yeah. didn't happen, but they didn't even... I don't know. They, they almost like, I don't know what happened. They, I, they, they continue to say, like, mm -hmm. he, I, I don't get it, is my point. I, I can tell you what I prophesied before that election from the Lord, because I'm accountable for that. Okay. Um, this is what I remember prophesying from the Lord. There were, there were two things. There was the word that was on Passover of 2020, and then there was the October 6th Clash of the Titans word, 2020. Right. The one on Passover was... You're about to see a baffling set of events leading up to this election. You're about to see a baffling set of events occur. And this election is going to be more baffling than the last. That was the word of the Lord on Passover that I gave. In 2020. In 2020. Long before long the before freaky events of November 2020. And then October 6, 2020, I remember the Lord talking about a clash of the titans in Washington, D.C., we were going to see. That was going to be historic. But he said, we are about to enter turbulence. Now, when the Lord tells you you're about to enter turbulence, but I'm still driving the plan, he said. It, it, it was a play on words. You right. know what I mean? So plain, we're the plan, plan, but we're going to go through turbulence. But we're entering turbulence. When you enter a very serious pocket of turbulence, yeah. everything shakes. You may be buckled in yeah. and safe, and you've got a good pilot at the helm that's navigating right. you through, but you still have to go through it. So when the Lord said, we are about to enter turbulence, yeah. I thought... This ain't good. This is not going to be good. This right. is not going to go as everybody right. thinks it's going to go right. here. That th you know what I mean? We're going to run into some serious yeah. issues. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like that's why when I mean, look, a lot of the reason people have a jaundiced view of the prophetic is because people will say something mm -hmm. emphatically, and if it doesn't happen, they don't go and say, you know, I got that wrong, or that they just forget it happened and they move on to the next thing. And I th that's just confusing, mm -hmm. and it does it does. Uh, Anyway, we're going to a break. Okay, final segment, Amanda Grace. Don't go away. Talking to Amanda Grace. Amanda, a, a lot of people um, are familiar with that there was a, a prophetic man named Kim Clement or Clement mm -hmm. who said like in 2007 that Donald Trump would be the president of the United States yes. for two terms, he mm -hmm. said, right? Yes. Now, he didn't say two consecutive terms. He right. said two terms, and I always, you know, point that but out. But he did say that. yes. And we have to at least say how shocking it would be that somebody would prophesy that or even say that in 2007. Mm -hmm. It's a shocking thing mm -hmm. because back then, almost nobody was thinking of Donald Trump. It was just like a yeah. crazy thing. Mm -hmm. And it happened, of course. And now Clem, Kim Clement passed away yeah. a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. He went on to glory. But uh, that's for sure. But he did say... Two terms. I believe he did say two terms. And and but you but but you know his daughter and Donna, you, you, yes, you met her friends. recently. Mm -hmm. Donna and I have become friends. Yes, dear friends. And where is she? Are they there? They're in the United States. She's or in, yeah, she's in Tennessee. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, what did what did she share with you? Because prophets often talk about mantles. I'm friends with Mario Marullo. He was mm -hmm. talking about the mantle of Catherine Kuhlman, and you know, yes. I know this gets a little weird for some people, but. In scripture, mm -hmm. 
it's clear that that you know a, a prophet they, they talk about this having mm-hmm. a mantle a covering yes. and that they pass it on to somebody or whatever yes. so talk about that so I, i'll preface this very quickly by saying a year and a half ago um i have a, a pastor friend ricky who had an open vision and he's not one to talk about these things and said amanda i saw you getting part of the mantle of kim clement And he wrote this down and I sort of just put it, you know, put it away. You know, I took it and I put it away. So at Reawaken America in Tennessee, Donna was instructed by God to take one of her father's mantles, which I have with me, and to place it on me herself. Now, she obviously was not in touch with your pastor friend who prophesied this over you. So this was a confirmation of this amazing thing that your pastor had said to you. yes. Uh, and so she was instructed by God to do this. And we went out to, to speak together, actually, and she did it then. She talked about a spirit of Absalom, something her father had prophesied years and years and years ago. And then she said that she had been instructed by God to take one of her father's mantles and the purple one. The Lord said to take the purple one and to place it on me herself. And so, here it is. So that, and that's yep, literally is Kim mm-hmm. Clements, is mm-hmm. that he would use that when he prophesied. Yes, this That's is one of them he would use. And she did, and she placed it on me. It was a very emotional moment, A, because of what I had been told so long ago that I kind of just put away, uh, and B, that she was you know, instructed by God, and she said, I've only done this a few times, but God clearly told me to do this, and I have to do this. And so, yeah. I mean, what it, it, it's, again, I know there are a lot of people listening, and they're like, they don't understand the vocabulary here. So that's a good reason for them to, mm-hmm. to check out your website, Ark of Grace hyphen ministries <laughs> You don't like that hyphen. No, you? if you don't put it in the hyphen, you won't get there. Ark of Grace hyphen ministries um, dot com. Well, it's just it's just great to have you here Thank in the you. studio. I'm glad you could get here. Uh, you know, most people don't live within driving distance, mm-hmm. so uh, and I'm glad Chris could get here. And I just you're you're. Um, your YouTube video, what if people want to find you on YouTube, what is it called? It's Ark of Grace Ministries. So you can go to youtube.com forward slash Ark of Grace Ministries. We're the same on Rumble. Facebook is Ark of Grace Ministries. Because I know there are people out that there the that have nothing to do with you, mm-hmm. that they will just like post, like there are people out they there pirate. just posting. Yes. Uh-huh. They're called pirates. Mm-hmm. It's illegal. We don't like you. It needs to stop. Uh, <laughs> But your stuff is, anyway, arcofgrace-ministries.com. Amanda Grace, we love you, and we're just grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, this is your daily reminder to please go to mypillow.com or mystore.com. And to get huge savings, use the code ERIC. If you don't believe me, here are some celebrity friends. Mama said to use the code ERIC. Use the code ERIC. ERIC. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much.